The new DGR2S has a host of extremely powerful functions compared to the Mavic Air 2, both for video and photography. The drone and the controller are the same, apart from the new 20 megapixel camera. But the DJI Fly app has now several new voices to accommodate a host of new features. Also, some of the photo and video settings have been arranged differently, and I had to spend some time searching for them. This video will go through all the most useful settings in the DJI Fly app. It's not meant only for beginner, as it can also help users coming from other drones to find their way around the new layout. I will not go through every single setting, but rather concentrate on the ones you really need to use. If you find it useful, don't forget to hit the like button. It makes me feel so much better. After launching DJI Fly Up, let's start with the menu settings as the behavior of some of the icons on the main screen may be affected by the settings. By tapping on the three dots at the top right, we access the settings where we see five tabs at the top. In safety, we can set the obstacle avoidance action to choose the behavior of the drone when it encounters an obstacle. If we choose bypass, we activate the new improved APAS-4 to detect and avoid obstacle, and the aircraft will try to find its way around it. If we choose brake, it will stop and hover. By selecting off, we remove obstacle detection, but only use this last option with plenty of extra care when you want to get very close to a subject. In flight protection we have some important parameters. Adjust the maximum altitude to conform to your local regulation. Here in old Europe, in most cases, is 120 meters. In the maximum distance, we set how far from the home point the drone can fly horizontally. In most cases, by regulation, we should fly in visual line of sight, which is around 300-350 meters. The auto return home altitude should be high enough to avoid surrounding obstacles, but not too high, as it would need extra battery life and can be dangerous in very windy conditions. I generally set it between 30 and 50 meters, according to the surrounding terrain. In sensors we can calibrate the compass and the IMU. This calibration has to be performed from time to time, if you notice an unusual flight behavior, like the aircraft drifting too much, the first thing to do is to perform this calibration, and in most cases the problem will be solved. Once we click on Calibrate, the app will drive us through the process, which is extremely simple and painless. Find my drone is useful when… that's right, when we lose our drone. As long as there is still battery life left, we can tap on the arrow to the left to see the aircraft position on the map. We can also tap on Start Flashing and Beeping to help us locate it. The last item is Advanced Safety Settings. Here we choose the behavior of the drone in case of loss of signal. I would make sure to avoid this sand, which is in my opinion dangerous, as the drone will land immediately and he might end up in someone's property, on water, or other places where it's hard to retrieve. Return to home is in general the best choice, unless you have obstacles above you, like trees, electric lines, or a roof, in which case it's better to choose hover. Let's move to the control tab. At the top we can choose the units that will be displayed anywhere else in DJI Fly. Metric, which can be set either in meters or in kilometers, or else Imperial, for feet and miles. In gimbal mode we have two options. Follow mode is the one that keeps the gimbal in line with the horizon and is the one we use most of the time when shooting video or taking photos. The other possibility is 
FPV mode, where the drone will lean sideways when turning, mimicking the behavior of a real plane. This function has been vastly improved in the R2S, due to the adoption of the same three-axis gimbal of the FPV drone. I can see this mode being used for some creative footage from time to time. Then we can choose to allow upward gimbal rotation. In this case the camera can be pointed up to 24 degrees above parallel. I find it very useful and leave it on on most occasion. The only downside is that the propellers might occasionally get in the shot, but so far the only time it happened is when flying in FPV mode. In advanced gimbal settings we can perform some of the most important adjustments for shooting video. We can set the pitch speed, which is how fast the gimbal tilts up or down when we scroll the left wheel of the remote control. For cinematic results it is important to choose a very low value, to get a battery smooth transition. The value of pitch smoothness determines how fast the tilt will stop once we release the wheel. I set it to an intermediate level to avoid an abrupt transition. In your rotation speed I choose a very low value to get a seamless lateral rotation when using the left stick of the controller. Your smoothness works similarly to pitch smoothness. The value can be set independently for each of the three flying modes, Cine, Normal and Sport. Further down we can customize the behavior of the function button of the remote control. I suggest setting the single tap to recenter gimbal, which basically toggles the camera from top down to straight ahead. The double tap can be assigned to several other functions, camera settings might be the most useful one. There is a flight tutorial that can be useful for beginners, as well as calibration of gimbal and remote control. Camera is the chopper we will be using the most. The first part at the top of the settings is context sensitive, in other words will vary according to the mode we are in, photo or video. We are in photo mode and at the top we choose the size of our still images. 3, 2 uses the whole sensor and is my favorite choice. The other possibility is 16.9 which crops the image to the classic video format. If we are in video mode the first part of the camera tab will show a series of settings relative to video. We can choose the format which really doesn't matter much. In general we use MP4 for Windows and MOV for Apple. The choice of color is very interesting. The mode normal is a traditional 8-bit color mode. For obvious reasons I cannot go in depth here about the color modes of the R2S, but they are one of the most important upgrades of this drone. I have analyzed in depth the color modes and other video functionality of the R2S in this video. Click on the link appearing on screen now to watch, it is very interesting. As I was saying, the color mode is the one aimed at users who do not rely on computer post-processing. It can be used in H.264 or H.265. H.264 is much more gentle on computer resources, but is only available for normal mode not available at, at 5.4 resolution or at frame rates higher than 30 frames per second. We then have a choice for the two 10-bit color modes, D-Log and HLG. Once again, refer to my previously mentioned video, as these modes are very important when shooting video with this drone. Further down there is a choice for video subtitles. When it is turned on, it is possible to access all the EXIF data with a video viewer like VLC Media Player. I find it really useful to check what color mode I was using, ISO value and so on. Further down we can choose to display a histogram on screen. I always do as I rely entirely on the histogram for exposure.
There is also the possibility of activating an overexposure warning. In this case, area overexposed will show a zebra stripe pattern. Some users like it, but I prefer to turn it off. The peaking level shows the area in focus with a red highlight when shooting in manual focus. This function is useful only when shooting very close to the subject, which is rarely the case with drones, so in most cases I leave it off. We can choose between several grid lines to help expose. My favorite is the one in the middle to apply the rule of thirds. Then we can choose auto or manual white balance. I suggest to always use manual, especially with video, as changes in luminosity often lead to bad color shift when using auto balance. Further down we can choose our storage location, as the Air 2S has about 8GB of internal storage. Not much if you're shooting video, but better than nothing if you happen to forget the SD card at home. You can choose to turn cache when recording, if you want to rapidly access your photos or footage immediately on your mobile device. In the Transmission tab there is generally no action to be taken. The last tab of the setting about is useful to check if you have the latest firmware installed. When I first used the R2 I spent a good amount of time trying to find how to choose RAW format for photos, change resolution in video, activate the zoom, set the white balance, and so on. These settings and many others used to be in the camera setting menu, but have now been moved. I started to think that they had been stolen, but don't worry, we will find them. In the bottom right part of the screen there are now several useful pieces of information and ways to change the settings according to the mode we are in. In photo mode we are informed that we are in auto by this icon. The first icon to the left is storage, showing how many photos we can shoot before we fill the memory. If we tap on it we can visualize the available space on the SD card and on the internal memory and we can switch from one to the other. Then we have the format where we can choose either JPEG or RAW plus JPEG. I still fail to understand why we cannot choose to save RAW only, which would be very useful. With the next icon EV we can adjust the auto exposure in steps of one third of a stop. When in auto mode, both for video and photo, if we click anywhere on the screen, an icon shaped like a tiny little sun will appear. By dragging it upwards or downwards, we can increase or decrease the exposure. By clicking on the auto icon, we move to more serious things. Manual mode, where you can also set the shutter speed, ISO value, and white balance. The setting apply only to the specific mode we are in, video or photo. In other words, when we set the exposure for video, the values previously set for photo will not be affected. If we move to video, we also have an icon to set the resolution and the frame rate. In 5.4K the maximum resolution is 30 frames per second, while in 4K, 2.7K and 1080p the maximum resolution is 60 frames per second. For ultra slow motion we can access 120 frames per second at 1080p in the photo video bottom above the shutter. One thing to notice is that when we move to a frame rate higher than 30 frames per second, there is a big crop of the image. Apparently only a part of the sensor is used in higher frame rates. Some users have complained about it. Frankly, I'm not worried, as in most cases when using slow motion, I want to be closer to the action. 
To the left of the shutter there is an icon to set the focus. We can tap on it and we can slide the finger to focus manually if we so wish. If we tap anywhere else on the screen, eh, the mode will remain in manual focus. But if we slide it instead until the very end, it will toggle to autofocus. Above the autofocus icon, we have one for the zoom, but it is only available in resolutions up to 4K at a frame rate of up to 30 frames per second. The zoom level is 4 times at 4K, 6 times at 2.7K, and 8 times at 1080p. By simply tapping on the icon, we move to the next zoom level. If we swipe with a finger, we can zoom progressively. For a smoother progressive zoom, we can use the scroll wheel in the remote control while holding the function button. The zoom function is not available in the 10-bit color modes, only in normal mode. The remaining icons on the main screen are similar to the ones on the other models. To the left we have a display of height and vertical speed. Next to it, horizontal distance and speed. On the left part there is the usual icon for takeoff. Press it once to access this window, then press and hold and the aircraft will take off at over at about 2 meters above the ground. Above there is an icon to show the obstacle avoidance action. It will be green when bypass is chosen, white for brake, and red to warn that the obstacle avoidance is off. By tapping on this icon we can toggle between green and white. A display on the top left shows in which flying mode we are in, cine, normal or sport. Further to the right, another display shows several warnings. In the top right, there are several icons. The round one shows the battery life in percentage. By tapping, we can visualize the time until return to home, time until forced landing, and time until battery depleted. Then there is a display for a remaining battery time, another one for the signal strength, and finally, an icon showing the number of satellites available. To better assimilate some of the video features discussed here, you can click on this video. It shows how all the different new functions of the R2S work. If you are mostly interested in photography, I suggest clicking on this one. And don't forget to click on the like button if you find this video interesting. Bye for now.